Hi everyone. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It's nice to see you all again, isn't it, Udari? You to the second session of Academic Hour Continuing Professional Development Lecture Series, organized by Clinical Society, based of Vidhi Mahiyanganya, together with Branch Union of Government Medical Officers Association. Today, we will look into another very, very important topic, advanced life support. And we invited one of the pioneer roles in initiating this program, that is Dr. Gayani Samaratunga, all the way from Anuradhapuri. Dear Madam, it is indeed a pleasure to have you in this evening. Welcome back, back to Mahayangani. The chapter you are learning today is going to save someone's life tomorrow, maybe even tonight. So pay attention. With kind invitation goes to Dr. Rohi Samaravikarana, consultant physician, to introduce our speaker. Over to you, sir. to introduce uh, Dr. Gayani Samarathunga, today's speaker. Uh, I'm sure this audience needs no introduction about Dr. Gayani uh, Samarathunga because she worked in uh, our hospital, Mayangani based hospital, uh, about one year and she's a very good uh, physician and she's a very good teacher. So anyway, uh, it is my duty to introduce uh, Dr. Gayani Samarathunga uh, for the audience today. Dr. Gayani Samarathunga, MBBS Kalania, MD Colombo. He, he's graduate, she graduated from uh, University of Kalania and completed his uh, postgraduate training at PGIM Colombo. Overseas training at Queen's Hospital, Comfort, uh, London, UK. And uh, she has uh, excellent uh, academic performance Actually, she won uh, 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 Dr. E.M. Vijayarama Award uh, for the best presentation at Young Physicians Forum uh, by uh, Ceylon College of Physicians 2020. And also, uh, she worked in uh, COVID hospital, Valikanda, during uh, the pandemic of COVID 2020. And, uh, she, she, her dedications and her excellent work at the Welcome the Hospital is uh, everybody know during that uh, disaster and the, this is a pandemic period. And also she worked in uh, Mayangani Hospital with us for about uh, one year and currently she is the consultant physician working in Anuradhapura Teaching Hospital. May I kindly uh, audibly invite Dr. Gayani Samarthunga to talk on uh, advanced life life support. How do you, Dr. Gayani? Very good evening to everyone. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Rohit Amaravitavana, for your kind introduction. And uh, first of all, let me exp express my sincerest gratitude uh, to Mahayangane Base Hospital Clinical Society and uh, this uh, uh, clinical program uh, and giving me this very good opportunity to discuss about one of the topics that I like most and I think the most important thing in anyone's training. 
actually I started training, I mean I started uh, teaching about the advanced life support when I was in uh, Valikhanda COVID in, uh, specialized COVID treatment unit. I mean we had so many casualties, so many patients. I really cannot count how many died on my hands in COVID time. It was a disaster, it was heartbreaking. And uh, at that time I decided, uh, me and my co-physician, Dr. Ramsha Senadira, we decided that we need to spread the word. We need to spread the knowledge. We have to share the knowledge. Sharing of this knowledge will save someone's life and uh, this is mandatory. I think that Dr. Gayan, the consultant anesthetist, wholeheartedly will agree with me and I think he will uh, hope that he will arrange some practical sessions most possibly in the near future. He's the best person for that. So this is just the theory part I am covering. The practical part will come in the near future, I hope. So the today topic is advanced life support, the ways to improve our practice. I hope that every can, everyone can hear me. So that uh, Everyone knows basic life support. Everyone knows advanced life support. We are doctors here. Everyone has resuscitated someone in this career. Every single person has, every single doctor here has resuscitated people. Every single doctor has had deaths in his or her hand. So without delaying, let's go. What I'm going to cover in this lecture what is the meaning of ALS? What's the definition? There's no universal definition as I'm aware. And we are going to talk about a bit of the structure, how to arrange something like that. It is something, this concept is something beyond a single doctor, a single hospital, a single country. So we have to think as an institute, how are we going to do this job properly? Then I'm going to discuss about the recognizing deterioration and how to prevent the cardiac arrest. Because most of the time, the cardiac arrest happening in the inward patients rather than the new admissions. So if we detect it early, we can prevent it. And then we'll be discussing the chain of prevention, the causes, common causes of cardiac arrest, and what is the ABCD approach, and then I'll be discussing about the advanced life support. Some of the topics I will not uh, elaborate much. Some of the topics I'll be elaborating much. So the meaning of advanced life support is it's something, it's a saving, life-saving protocol uh, that, and skills that will extend beyond basic life support. And this will help to further the circulation to provide an open airway and adequate ventilation. So what's the meaning of chain of survival? Chain of survival means that certain interventions that contribute to a successful outcome after a cardiac arrest. So what's the basic idea of giving advanced life support or the, what's the basic idea of cardiopulmonary resuscitation? Do you have to send someone with a brain damage home? No so that you are not going to send a vegetative person to vegetative person home so you want to definitely you want to save the life that's a basic idea but meantime you expect the patient to go in good condition so there are four links and if there are four links any chain is only as strong as its weakest link it's like the same it's a group work like that so all four links should be strong. Let's see what are these four links. The first uh, link is the early recognition and calling for help. Second one is early CPR. Third one is early defibrillation. And the fourth one is the post resuscitation care. So that Early recognition of critical ill patient at risk of cardiac arrest in hospital is very important. As I told that most of the time cardiac arrest happen in involved patients, 
not in the OPD or the new admissions. It is definite that more, sometimes the new admissions also get arrest on the table, that's true. But uh, the thing is that uh, it is most of the time happening in already admitted patients. And uh, we have to, I mean, in certain institutes, something like National Hospital Sri Lanka, or in, uh, as I'm aware, to, uh, in a certain era in uh, National Hospital Kandy, there were resuscitation teams arranged, and this concept was actually uh, discussed. And uh, in that time, actually, there was a certain number allocated for this resuscitation team. So anyone with a patient get arresting or patient get uh, in patient needs any help, anyone can call it. So it's important as an institute to have a certain policy and. Uh, have a certain adapted number to call the resuscitation team or the medical emergency team. I'm not asking that it should be happen tomorrow in my young day. What I'm telling is it's a good concept for any institute in the country. And early CPR means uh, chest compressions and the ventilation will slow down the deterioration of the brain and heart. And it will doubles or quadruples the chance of survival. So it should be started as soon as possible and if, if anyone is suspecting the patient is in cardiac arrest. And even chest, if the single person is available and if reluctant to give mouth to mouth breathe, if there's no apparatus, ventilator apparatus available at that time, even chest compression alone can save the lives. And uh, it is chest compression only CPR is better than nothing. And in time, we have to know that we have to check the rhythm and CPR should not delay any chance of deep fibrillation. So it is told that early deep fibrillation within three to five minutes of collapse will increase the survival rates as high as 50 to 70 percent. It's a significant uh, ratio actually. And each minute delay will reduce the probability of survival by 10 to 12 percent. And in that case, it is important to train sufficient amount of healthcare personnel for this uh, procedure. According to best of my knowledge, most of the institute, institutes that I have worked, apart from the doctors, even nursing officers actually do not most of them do not know how to use a defibrillator. And post resuscitation care, the goal is to return the patient to a state of normal cerebral function, stable cardiac rhythm and normal hemodynamic function. Post resuscitation care is equally important as the uh, CPR. So, 80% of we are discuss, going to discuss about recognizing deterioration and prevention of cardiorespiratory arrest. And 80% uh, of cases, clinical signs deteriorate over the few hours before the arrest. So, there are certain concepts in advanced life support guidelines provided by the European Resuscitation Council. And it is called the chain of prevention. This starts with staff education. Education means it's a target education. How to observe the patients, how to interpret the found observed sign, and recognition of signs of deterioration, and what is the ABCD approach, and how to stabilize the patient. These things should be, the, the staff should be educated and the knowledge should be shared. Uh, literally, we are doing it now, actually. Literally, I am doing that. Then, what about, then the second step is monitoring. That enough uh, equipments and everything should be provided to the, specifically the nursing officers and the doctors, and uh, they should be explained about the recording the vital signs. Then the recognition is that whatever they have monitored, whatever the blood pressure they have got, whatever the pulse rate they have got, they have to interpret it. So, there are certain scores invented in, uh, in the world. So, it is the world accepted one is early warning score. 
otherwise we call it national early morning scores as well it's uh, abbreviated as news so this will allow the doctors or nurses to understand who are the patients that will need additional monitoring or who are the people who need intervention and this intervention can be early intervention can be four hour data intervention can be hard very early intervention can be emergency intervention and then we should make sure that all the staffs are empowered all the responsible staffs are empowered to call for help people sometimes do not call for help when they feel that they will be criticized may not be in this country even maybe in this country people will not call for help because thinking that uh, well if i call for help they will ask unnecessary questions they will ask why did you call me why did you call the because the just patient is just drop in situation can't you do anything about it no the people should be allowed to ask to help i mean ask for help we should not criticize we should allow we should empower the people to ask for help if no one is asking for help there will be lots of deaths then the response then uh, we should make sure that a person that once the page, the deteriorating signs are found and the new score is high and when the uh, we have that uh, someone is called for help that a uh, patient the person a doctor with appropriate acute or critical care skills and experience should attend for it initially the house officers might attend but always the care should be the condition should be escalated and we should make sure that a person experienced person with enough skills and knowledge is attending to the patient so this is the early uh, news otherwise uh, national early warning scores i'm not going to emphasize on this everyone knows that and uh, at the moment we are not using it in sri lanka we are just uh, usually going for the hemodynamics the heart heart rate blood pressure and uh, the lung signs and the ecs but this is a universally accepted score sometimes you might encounter this in the future so this is is very this score is a very important one in that case it's better to have an idea so if we emphasize certain points here even the respiratory respirate rate less than 8 cause cause 3 respiratory rate more than 25 again cause 3 so these both are equally important it is not only the tachypnea that is important apnea is also important another important point to point out is that uh, there is a spo2 scale too this was not in the new scores which were uh, published in the early years there was only one saturation scale but they have invented another saturation scale and they have Uh, told that the people with type 2 respiratory failure the hypercarbic status copd patients should have it spo2 scale 2 because otherwise we will be having unnecessary and call will be calling for unnecessary cases and uh, you can uh, that you can see that temperature is also included so in even hypothermia that hypothermia is a common case in other countries so in that case uh, it should also be included and this specifically when we are talking about the consciousness it should be acute onset confusion not the chronic confusion the patient may be uh, dementic and uh, dementic for years you are not going to call for that there's no point of calling for patient with dementia is having chronic confusion for quite a long time or be a may be a, be a patient with hypoxic ischemic brain damage or we are talking about the new onset confusion so when we are paying particular interest to these scores it's always uh, better to know the fine points the others are i mean it's straightforward and i'm not going to uh, elaborate on this actually once the new score is recorded according to there's a guide provided and according to them you can escalate to the appropriate doctor and there should be structured communication tools in any hospital any institute to for the communication 
As an example, there, there are two uh, internationally accepted ones. First one is SBAR and the second one is RSVP. SBAR means the situation, background, assessment and recommendation. So what does this mean? As an example, uh, if I am the nursing officer, I might be having a 45-year-old gentleman uh, who is complaining of chest pain and dyspnea now. So what I'll be informing the doctor over the phone is, I'm talking, first I'm talking about the situation. First I have to introduce myself. Doctor, I'm a Mrs. So-and-so, the nursing officer in this particular ward. I've got Mr. So-and-so, 45-year-old gentleman, and my the acute, the very first reason I'm calling is, at the moment, he's complaining of severe type in dietary pain, and he's shouting, and he's having his saturation dropping. His saturation at the moment is 88. And the background history is he's a diagnosed case for, a diagnosed patient with ischemic heart disease for last three years with a ejection fraction of 30 and diagnosed of having systolic heart failure, not undergone on any particular coronary intervention up to now. And my, in my assessment, I found that patient is dropping his saturation and he's breathless, he cannot talk in full sentences, and his back pressure is this much. And as a nursing officer, I started him on oxygen, I started nebulization, and I kindly ask you to come and see the patient. So this is the protocol of structured communications tool SBAR. The same goes as the RSVP. Reason is equal to situation, story is equal to background, vital signs equal to assessment, plan is equal to recommendation. It is what you are telling to the other person. This allows us to talk about the specific points rather than jabbering about something unnecessary. Whatever you, in a situation like this, whatever you are talking should be very specific. Next, we will try to cover the causes of cardiac arrest. So, there are three reasons, main three reasons in the world that can cause to car, that can lead to cardiorespiratory arrest. The very first one is airway problem, second one is breathing problem, and the third one is circulatory problems. So if we talk about the airway obstruction, there are so many causes for airway obstruction. It can be intranominal content, and uh, it may be blood or vomitus or secretions inside the uh, trachea and uh, all the uh, lower airways that is causing the obstruction. Sometimes the patients with CNS depression, they are their tongue is falling back, and this can happen in head injuries, patients with increased ICP, patients with some uh, metabolic conditions like hypo or hyperglycemia, hypercapnia, and even certain drugs, some sedatives like benzodiazepines, opiates, and maybe even alcohol intoxication. Then there are certain conditions that can cause laryngeal edema, mainly the infections, and even inflammation due to anaphylaxis. There may be external compressions, but usually these causes are surgical, and uh, that can be hematomas, tumors, or goiters, and maybe trauma that is again surgical related, fracture mandible or maxilla, or sometimes any facial fracture, and uh, sometimes inhalational injury and burn injuries. Breathing problems, again, we divided into three. We can divide it as decreased respiratory drive, decreased respiratory effort, and decreased gas exchange. So, decreased respiratory drive usually happens in CNS problems. Decreased respiratory effort can be due to any muscle weakness. This may, can be myopathy, this can be neuromuscular junction disorders, this can be uh, anything related to even myositis. And then there can be nerve damage, especially the phrenic nerve. And restrictive chest defects sometimes uh, can keep lead to decrease respiratory effort. Flyer chest, pneumonia, hemothorax. And then pain from the fracture ribs, usually in old age, can cause respiratory effort, decrease respiratory effort. Decreased gas exchange is the one that medically that we are encountering commonly. It can be any pulmonary uh, disease that will lead to the 
They, uh, they use gas exchange as an example. Can be pneumonia, ARDS, maybe uh, pulmonary embolism, maybe asthma COPD, or the pulmonary edema. Then we are going to the circulation problems. So when we consider the circulation problems, it can again be primary heart problems or secondary heart problems. So primary heart problems means that myocardium is usually getting affected and then it is causing the reduction of the ionotropic activity of the heart. The commonest reason we ever encounter is the acute coronary syndrome. Can be dysrhythmias, tachyarrhythmias as well as bradyarrhythmias, cardiac failure, cardiac tamponade, cardiac rupture, myocarditis, cardiomyopathies, and sometimes electrocution and certain drugs. Secondary is secondary causes means the heart is affected by changes elsewhere in the body. As an example, tension pneumothorax can cause later shutdown of the circulation. Can be asphyxia can also cause the same, and there can be acute severe blood loss. There is no primary heart cardiac problem, but eventually this will give rise to low cardiac output. Can be severe anemia, hypothermia, severe septic shock, any reason of hypovolemia, hypo or hyperkalemia, hypocalcemia, and certain toxins. Now let's go to the A, B, C, D, E approach. So, we are using this systematic approach to assess and treat, a, treat to an acutely ill patient. What's important of adhering to this approach is that uh, you will not, you make sure, you're making sure you are not missing anything. I mean, uh, if you do not have any plan, I mean, that in that case, you might be checking blood pressure now, checking the airway now, and then you are just checking the temperature after that. Like that, we cannot really do this business. We should have a proper way of assessing people. That's why this is created, and it is airway breathing circulation. And it is told that if you find any problem in A, you should sort it out before going to B. So basic underlying principles related to the ABCD approach is you should correct life-threatening abnormalities before moving on to the next part. And you must assess the effects of treatment after you have finished the thing. And you have to recognize what are the circumstances that will you, you will need help. As an example, you may be a house officer. You might think that you need SHO help or consultant help or registrar or SRT's help when you are handling this condition, your opinion is not enough. Meantime, when you are doing this ABCD approach, you are not acting alone. It is not only your responsibility. There are a whole lot of people, so you should use all members of the team. There are a lot of things to do, uh, to be done. You have to assess the patient, you have to attach the monitors, you have to get the blood, you have to cannulate the person, and there should be effective communication. You should not harass anyone, you should not argue with anyone. You should not order, I mean, you can order, but it should be a kind way. You should not ask, uh, okay, you are supposed to do this, why didn't you do this? Like that, you cannot, I mean, there effect, should be effective way of communication without criticism. And meantime, it's important to remember that it is better to have DNAR policy. DNAR means do not attempt cardiopulmonary resuscitation. We sometimes call it DNA-CPR. And uh, in some countries, this is mandatory. Each and every patient having a certain mandate about whether we are going to do DNA-CPR, whether we are going to give CPR or not, is a must. So. It's better to have this type of decision made early, otherwise you will be resuscitating and uh, you will be uh, unnecessarily uh, bothering a patient whose life cannot be really extended. So,
Sorry, we're just one minute. So when we assess the airway, uh, you should first go to the patient and ask, how are you, or are you okay? So if the patient is talking, and if there's a verbal response, it obviously shows that pa a patient is having patent airway. And uh, if you think that the patient is having a threatened airway, you should look for, you should look, listen, and feel. Very first thing to look for is breathing movement and whether the patient is coughing. Very first thing to listen is whether there's any airflow at the mouth and nose. Very first thing to feel, whether you can feel his breathing air on your cheek. So if the patient is in lying down position, you can uh, drop down to patient and you can see all this, you can do all these things within five seconds with a single moment. So after checking for the breathing moments, you can check some other things, something like that, whether there's any paradoxical chest movements, whether there's increased work of breathing. That means that if the breathing moments are there, so if the breathing moments is not there, you are not going to waste your time. Uh, looking for the other things. That's why I have mentioned the breathing movements and coughing first. If there's increased work of breathing, that means the accessory muscles of respiration is in use. There'll be nasal flaring. If it's a small child or infant, there'll be rib retraction. You can check whether there's any foreign body around the mouth, whether there's any blood dormometer, something like that. If the patient is drowsy, whether the patient is cyanosed. Then you will listen for airflow at the mouth and nose first. If it is not there, you are not going to check anything else. You are going to start CPR. If airflow at the if they, if you can listen to for the airflow, then you will check whether the patient is having noisy breathing. There are so many types of noisy breathing. There can be snoring. There can be gurgling. There can be inspiratory stride or expiratory wheezes. So I have put out the causes here but I'm not going to discuss them in detail. And then you are look, going to feel for air on your cheek first. If it is not there, don't waste your time looking for the other things, start CPR. If, the, if you can feel air on your cheek, check for tracheal deviation. It will give you an idea whether the patient is having a pneumothorax, whether there's any underlying lung fibrosis or lung collapses, there, whether there's any mass effusion. And look for any facial fractures any subcutaneous emphysema. The golden rule is noisy breathing is obstructed breathing. You have to do something about it if the patient is having noisy breathing. But complete obstruction, meantime, will not cause noisy breathing. There will be complete absence of airway sounds. So if the patient is having uh, airway obstruction, you should do the airway opening maneuvers. So everyone knows that it is head tilt, chin lift, and jaw thrust. Head tilt should be practiced only in certain situations that you are sure that the patient is not having any cervical injuries. And you can try with airway suction insert an oropharyngeal or nasopharyngeal airway and start the patient with high concentration, oxygen, 15 liters, with the, using a non-rebreathing mask. Please make sure it's not a facial mask. It's not the usual face mask. It should be an RBM. It should be a non-rebreathing circuit. And you can call for expert help and might need to tracheal intubation later. So the breathing assessment you are going to check for the effort of breathing. You can check the respirate rate and pattern of and pattern and the depth of breathing, whether the axillary muscles are in use, whether there are any inspiratory or expiratory noises, or if there are any chest drains, whether they are draining. And the efficacy of breathing, you can check 
the simplest way is the check in the oxygen saturation and then you can for the check for the chest expansion you can focus for the chest and look for any hyper resonance indicating pneumothorax or any stony dullness indicating pleural effusions and you can auscultate and look for any bronchial breathing suggestive of consolidation whether there is any uh, reduction in AR entry as in pneumothorax and pleural effusions and consolidations and then whether there is any added sounds that is guiding you to find any underlying pathology. Effect of breathing also you can check but it is uh, I mean it's not may not be 100% correct. So if the patient is not having inadequate breathing, airway is patent but inadequate breathing. So always the specific treatment depends on the cause. If it is a tension pneumothorax, you have to relieve it. If it is COPD exacerbation, you have to relieve the bronchoconstriction. If it is consolidation, you have to treat for the pneumonia and give oxygen. So that uh, patients who are critically ill should receive oxygen and in COPD it is better to adhere to a uh, target of SpO2 from 88 to 92. Otherwise, you might be taking the patient into type 2 respiratory failure if you give high concentration. And with the good heart, you are causing a disadvantage to the patient. And uh, you can always use bag valve mask, the ambu ventilation. And uh, in cooperative patients, you might try non-invasive ventilation as well. So the circulation assessment. Uh, there's a golden rule considering that all, emergical, all medical and surgical emergencies, hypovolemia is the primary cause for shock until proven otherwise. That means that there are so many causes in the world for shock, but in uh, Critical ill patients who are on daily arrest conditions, it is considered it is always hypovolemia. So that means that you have to give the fluid unless you are going to prove that the patient is having a definitive contraindication for that fluids. So we have to assess for the color of the hands, whether they are blue, pink, pale, or mottled. What is the limb temperature here, whether it's cool or warm?
Yeah, we were talking about the circulation assessment before the lines were installed. So that uh, uh, we were talking about how to assess the circulation. So you can uh, check capillary field time, and you can check whether the patient is having peripheral or central cyanosis. And uh, sorry, that the patient is having peripheral or central pulses. And in the meantime, it's better to check whether they have equality of the pulses. Uh, and uh, rate and the quality and regularity. These all the thing, all things are important. Rate is important with the patient is having tachyarrhythmia, it will be indicated. And the regularity, if the patient is having arrhythmia, it will be changed. And equality in certain conditions like uh, arctic rupture, there will be uh, delay in the radial pulses and radio femoral delay will be there. And then you have to check. The ECG monitor and not the rhythm and heart rate. So measuring the blood pressure is important. Even if it is considered as one of the simplest things, it can give a lot of details. As an example, the patient is having low diastolic blood pressure. Patient is having arterial vasodilatation. And usually that happens in anaphylaxis and sepsis. Well, I don't think that's correct. <laughs> and uh, if the narrow pulse pressure is there, it indicates that uh, the patient is having peripheral vasoconstriction, and which is usually it is happening in cardiogenic shock and hypovolemia. So then you can auscultate the heart and find, try to find whether there are any new onset murmurs which will indicate if there's any ventricular septal ruptures or new onset MRs. You might find some pericardial rubs indicating tamponade or pericardial effusion. You can find muffled heart sounds, again, suggestive of tamponade. You might be finding missing beats, suggestive of atrial arrhythmias or ventricular arrhythmias. And auscultate for lung bases, have a good idea whether the patient is already having pulmonary edema or not and check the patient's uh, output uh, with urinary catheter, it will give you a good idea of poor cardiac output if the patient is having oliguria. And meantime, examine thoroughly for any external hemorrhages from wounds or drains or evidence of any concealed hemorrhages, especially if you are working in a surgical ward. So, once you have detected the circula circulatory failure treatment, always remember it is hypovolemia unless proven otherwise. So the specific treatment will be determined by the underlying cause. If the patient is a diagnosed patient with uh, severe pneumonia and having sepsis for days, and uh, already on inotropes, now the worsening can be, I mean, it is obviously septic shock. We are not talking about a condition like that. We are telling it is hypovolemia unless proven otherwise. That means if the cause is very evident, you do not take it as hypovolemia. And you have to look for signs of conditions that are immediately life-threatening, something like tamponade, continuing hemorrhage, severe sepsi septic shock, and treat them urgently. For septic shock, there's a certain different guideline, surviving sepsis guidelines. And otherwise, we ha you have to adhere to this type of regime, which is recommended in ERC guideline. You have to give a rapid fluid challenge of 500 ml of warmed crystalloid. This can be normal saline or heart marks. Over 15 minutes if the patient is hypotensive. You can use smaller volumes if the patient is elderly or if the patient is a diagnosed patient with cardiac failure and you have to monitor closely. And e after each bolus, you have to listen to the chest for bibasal crepitations, suggestive of pulmonary edema. And you have to reassess every five minutes, targeting a systolic blood pressure of more than 100 mercury millimeters. And if the patient is having a uh, Poor, uh, that poor improvement, then you can uh, you can think about uh, putting a central venous line. And if there's no signs of improvement, please repeat the fluid challenge. And uh, if the uh, symptoms and signs of cardiac failure comes, 
decrease the fluid infusion. And uh, in the stock wave cases, you might need to seek for alternative means of improving tissue perfusion. And uh, if the patient is having chest pain, which is one of the, uh, the myocardial ischemia is the commonest cause uh, for the circulatory failure. So try to get a 12-lead ECG and uh, treat initially with aspirin, nitroglycerin, oxygen if needed, and with morphine. Then under the disability, we are assessing three things. We are going to do a neurological assessment, but we must remember neurological assessments and the other things can vary. Then nothing is urgent than ABC. ABC should be assessed before any disability assessment. And uh, level of consciousness can be assessed a with ABPU. You can even check for GCS. Assess ABPU. A means alert. P means responding to voice. P means respond only to pain. U means unresponsive. Anything equal to P or below is, it means that GCS is less than eight. You can check for unequal pupils, something like single pupil with hydration and unreactivity as well. And meantime, make sure that you are checking for CBS to detect hypoglycemia. And disability. Please. Can you take it from here? Uh, blood glucose. And uh, you can to treat the electrolyte and metabolic disorders. Then we are talking about the exposure, and in exposure you are going to check the temperature, whether the patient is having a fever and it will give an indication of infection, and it can be the result of prolonged convulsions or shivering, and uh, whether the patient is hypothermic as well, maybe not in this country, but uh, in other countries might, and uh, whether there are any rashes and bruising, and whether there are any rashes suggestive of meningococcal sepsis, and uh, whether there is any uh, petechiae suggestive of dengue hemorrhages, and whether there, are, there can be bruising in sepsis, and uh, maculopapilloid matters rashes in allergic reactions, and uh, some forms of sepsis. And meantime, look for pitting edema, any external bleeding, and in tropical countries, if you have found a patient unconscious after in exposure, look specifically for fang marks and specifically look for any poison smells. So, once the vital signs are stable, try to take a full history. If you, the patient cannot give, try to find someone and get a full history. And always go to the patient's notes and charts and find whatever the previous values of the trended values and what is the trajectory of this patient's clinical condition and what is the trajectory of the investigations. And uh, check for the routine medications and uh, consider the level of care that is required, whether the patient is going to end up in ICU, ICU, if needed, please escalate. And consider definitive treatment for the underlying cause. And make sure that you are putting a complete note in the clinical note in the patient's file or the PhD and always hand over the patient. So now we will be entering to the most important part in this discussion, advanced life support. So the last guideline actually came in 2021 and uh, it is ideal that hospitals should have a resuscitation team that immediately respond to in-hospital cardiac arrest, but it is not always happening. And uh, 
resuscitation team members should have the key skills and knowledge to manage a cardiac if a cardiac arrest happens they should be should have skills on manual defibrillation why i am telling it as manual defibrillation is that in most of the european countries it is not manual defibrillation you attach the pads and it is automatic defibrillation but any doctor uh, should have skills on manual defibrillation as well and advanced airway management how to get intravenous access or intraosseous access and identification and treatment of reversible causes and in ideal situation the resuscitation team should meet at the beginning of each shift and uh, should introduce themselves and they should allocate the team roles usually this is not happening in sri lanka because the each ward that, uh, that uh, each and every ward is having separate doctors staffs uh, but it is best to decide who is having the best skills for certain things i mean that there may be certain people who are very skilled in intubation there may be people some doctors may be very skilled in chest compression so in that case it is better to uh, allocate the roles and keep and one of the fallbacks i have observed uh, in most of the hospitals is there is no lead this point i would i sh want to emphasize and i think i should there's no lead in any resuscitation hardly i can find a lead no one is leading and i don't know why but no one is leading there's no lead uh, so many people are there and so many people are giving different commands it's not criticizing i mean this is what is happening if there are five people HO giving a different command, SHO giving a different command, consultant giving another different command. So that is not going to work. There must be a leader, and the most experienced person should be the leader. And other people might criticize later. And other people, the other group members might think that, okay, that leading is not very good. You can always discuss it later. It's not an issue at all. But you cannot discuss this during the cardiopulmonary resuscitation. That is not the time. That leader is the leader at that particular time. Next time you might lead, but not at that particular situation. You might lead later. You can uh, con escalate your concerns to the hospital management or the other doctors, or you can discuss it. It's not a big issue. But there should be a leader. Most of the time people are not leading thinking that the other people will criticize. That's a big issue. If there's no leader, various people will be issuing various commands. Some are asking to give IV adrenaline. Some are asking to attach the monitor. Another one is shouting, check CBS. This is not proper resuscitation. So I'm not going for this video now. Yes, we are short of time. So now we are going to discuss about the advanced life support algorithm. So first let's go to the next slide and come back. So in your assessment in ABCDE, you should ask the patient, how are you? If normal verbal response comes, then mean, it means that patent airway is there. And is, the patient is breathing and there's brain perfusion. If the patient is answering you back and showing some response, you are going for ABCDE approach. If the patient appears to be unconscious, you can ask whether the patient, are you all right? And uh, you can do the 
airway tilting, that uh, airway opening using head tilt, chin lift, and jaw thrust. And you should look and look, listen, and feel for 10 seconds for airway patency. And if signs of life present only, you go for A, B, C, D, E. If no signs of life shown, then you are going to straight to CPR. So can, I think you can understand the difference, whether which way you are going, whether you are going for A, B, C, D, E, or whether you are directly going for CPR, depends on patient's basic assessment. You open the airway, and you lick, lick, listen and feel for 10 seconds, look for the chest movements, and breathing movements, listen for the breath sounds, feel for air on your cheek, and you assess the carotid pulse. If signs of life present, you are going for A, B, C, D, E. No signs of life, you are going to CPR without any delay. And you must attach the ECG monitor, pulse oximeter. Maybe ECG monitor is the only one you may be having, and we pick up as soon as possible. possible. And, and you, you should get, get ID access with a 16 of 18 day cannula and uh, sent BBG and other drugs you think that is necessary, it depends on the condition. If the patient is having chest pain, send him basic drugs and proponate is important. If the patient is having hemorrhage, send him the basic drugs with grouping and DT is important. It depends on the situation, it is not same for each and every patient. But make sure that you are doing BBG. It's necessary in the CPR. So now the patient is not showing any signs of life. You are not going for ABCD, you are going for CPR. You start CPR immediately and you start chest compressions and you start the mass ventilation and ventilation. You start the patient on hydroxygen, you must start the timing. You should start timing, you are having enough members, otherwise you don't know what is the downtime. You can ask for the help, and if there's a way sustain, call them. And you can collect resuscitation equipment, and you should ask to get a DP related. If you are the single person, which is very unlikely to happen in any hospital setting, you should leave the patient, get the resuscitation equipment, and come back. You can't help, you have to stop CPR, go get the equipment, and restart it. It will not happen in hospital setups. And then you have to continue the chest compressions, and you must make sure it is in high quality. So the rate, high quality means it is the rate is 30 to 2. Unless the patient is having secured airway, with the nasopharyngeal airway or the ET tube. So 30 chest compressions into two ventilations till airway secured. After that, you can continue chest compressions without pausing for ventilation. And where are you going to position your interlock hands is the middle of the half, middle part of the lower half of the sternum. And depth should be five to six centimeters. Rate should be 100 to 120 compressions per minute. And you should allow chest to recoil after each compression, and any interruption should be minimized less than five seconds. Then you can use for the uh, ventilation, you can use the ambu bag, that is the bag valve mask, bag valve mask uh, circuit, or the laryngeal mask airway. And inspiratory time should be about one second. You should give enough volume to produce a visible rise of chest wall, but sh you should not give any forceful breaths, not very harshly. And about 10 breaths per minute is adequate. And you should try to secure the airway if possible. And tracheal intubation should be only be attempted by a competent and experienced person. And the pause should be less than five seconds. And once you get the defibrillator, you attach the electrodes or self-adhesive electrodes. And it, this should happen while giving the chest compressions. And uh, once the defibrillator or whatever the ECG monitor in Sri Lanka you have attached, then you should stop chest compressions for five seconds to check for rhythm. And rhythm should be checked by the team leader. And then you have to restart. And after this, according to the cardiac rhythm, algorithm divides. 
so first we will go to the shockable rhythm so in your rhythm check you detected the patient is having vf or pulseless vt so we resume the chest compressions immediately and uh, we have to if they are self adhesive plants we have to uh, put them on the conventional anterolateral the sternal apical position otherwise uh, you can do it manually so what you are going to do is that this is the positioning the right pad is placed to the right of the sternum below the clavicle apical pad is placed in the left mid axillary line approximately level with the v6 lead this position should be the latter position should be clear of any breast tissue otherwise you will cause some burn injury then you have to warn all the team to stand clear this is apart from the person who is giving the chest compressions you have still not charged even so you are not going to ask everyone away because the chest compression person also running away then no one is giving chest compressions that should not happen you should alert all the team and you specifically ask the person who is doing the chest compressions continue i will tell you when i am going to deliver the shock other people stand clear but the person who is doing the chest compressions must continue then you select the appropriate energy it should be at least 150 joules in biphasic ones and you press the charge button <coughs> you take off any oxygen mask or nasal cannula and place them at least 1 meter away from the patient's chest if the patient is uh, in a ventilation circuit with a tracheal tube or subtrochoic airway excuse me the oxygen exhaust should be directed away from the chest and if the patient is connected to a ventilator the breathing circuit uh, can be left alone without interrupting <coughs> so then you should make sure that the person who is giving the chest compression is the only one touching the patient then ask him or her to stand clear and deliver the shock and immediately we should resume the cpr with a 32 to ratio there is no rhythm check you should continue cpr for 2 minutes and, and then, then only you are going, going to check, check the rhythm, rhythm. within these 2 minutes there is no interruption to the reassess no reassessing of rhythm no pain parts you give the cpr for 2 minutes I'm sorry. And if we have for pulsar CT pulses after in the next rhythm check, you have to repeat the same steps and deliver the second shock. And the shock energy can be same or higher. And again, you are going to be check rhythm after two minutes. And still, we have pulsar CT pulses. You repeat the same step and deliver the third shock. Then you again resume the CPR immediately and give. for 2 minutes within these 2 minutes you are going to give certain other things after delivering the third shock you are going to give iv adrenaline 1 mg in 1 in 10000 solution <coughs> i'm sorry and uh, give me iv i'm your down 300 mg ideal in 5% dextrose and uh, this is after the third shock and then again you are going to recheck rhythm in 2 minutes and if there are same thing goes on then you can continue this and uh, you can give further you can give further adrenaline after alternate shocks you can deliver some more defibrillation shocks and if organized electric activity observed during rhythm check you can Uh, check for pulses and signs of uh, reversal uh, return of spontaneous circulation ros means the return of spontaneous circulation if ros achieved you can go for post resuscitation care if vf or pulse vt persist you can go for uh, additional dose of amiodarone after the fifth defibrillation attempt and it should be 150 mg 
you can do this if we <coughs> if uh, you can do this even if vf for pulse respiratory recurs that means that patient was in uh, vf and then went into a systole and again come to the vf still you can give this dose Lignocaine can be used as an alternative for the amiodarone, but it is bet uh, better not to repeat. Uh, I mean, it uh, give lignocaine as the repeat one. If you want to stick to lignocaine, you can stick to lignocaine, but you cannot give uh, amiodarone first and lignocaine second. <coughs> then let's discuss, discuss briefly about the non-chocolate liver. So, the non sugar rhythms are asystole and pulsus electrical activity. You, you can, can give, uh, you have to start, once you have started CPR, the next thing you are going to give in this condition is IV adrenaline and you know the dose. And you must continue CPR for two minutes without any interruption. You should not stop chest compressions within these two minutes just because you see a rhythm in the monitor. You might see some rhythm in the monitor, but you are not going to stop chest compressions merely for that. While you are giving chest compressions, if you think there is a rhythm and you must stop the chest compressions, then someone else can check for the pulse, not you. You are giving chest compressions. You, are, you cannot check for that. Someone else is going to check for pulse. Someone is going to check for the other signs of ROSC. The patient is having some spontaneous breathing eff uh, effort, something like that, or that central pulse is nicely palpable and showing some uh, GCS improvement, showing consciousness improvement. In this type of scenario, you must consider to terminate it, terminate the chest compressions early before these, before these, two, these two minutes. Otherwise, just because there's a rhythm in the monitor, because I have seen this in real life, I have seen this so many times in real life. You're not going to do that. You just do not stop it before two minutes just because there's a rhythm and you are going, not going to check the pulse. Someone else can do it for you. So it's better to stick to no rhythm check before two minutes. Check it in two minutes. You just cannot check it as you like. And rhythm check should in every two minutes with a five, pause, five second pause, it should not delay more than that. I'm sorry, I think one of the slides are missing. Just give me one minute, one second. So if the patient is having non-shockable rhythm, you are going to check the uh, rhythm in two, two minutes. And uh, then you, what you are supposed to do is, uh, if the uh, non-shockable rhythm persists, you can continue the CPR immediately and you can give IV adrenaline 1 in 10,000 in, in alternate, alternate cycles. cycles. I'm, I'm sorry, sorry that's, that's why it is missing. missing. I'm, I'm very sorry, sorry for this. this. Not, the, not, not every, every cycle. cycle. So, so it, it is recommended, recommended to give IV adrenaline in 3 to 5 minutes. minutes. That's, that's how the guideline says. So, so the rhythm check, check will happen in every 2 minutes. minutes. So, so that, that means you can give Adrenaline in every four minutes. Three to five minutes. minutes. Adrenaline is four minutes. So no, it is not every cycle. Adrenaline. You cannot give adrenaline too much. It is. It's not going to help. So you have to give IV adrenaline in alternate cycles. Continue this and. Uh, if, if the, the patient, patient is converted to a shockable rhythm, you can uh, turn into shockable rhythm algorithm. Otherwise, you have to continue in the same manner. There is no idea in that or no anything like something like that or any antiarrhythmic drugs in non shockable rhythm. In the meantime, the team leaders specifically look to identify and treat for the reversible causes. <coughs> 
though there are four H's and four T's that we should look for and wait for. So we should look for hypoxia and uh, so we should give adequate ventilation with 100% oxygen. Meantime, we should treat for hypovolemia. So whatever the case, start intravascular volume expansion with fluids or blood. And if the patient is stop, uh, having any bleeding, you should do something to stop the bleeding. If there are risks, hypokalemia, uh, hypocalcemia, hypoglycemia, hypocalcemia, acidemia, or other metabolic problems, you should give appropriate treatment. And if the patient is having hypothermia, must use the blankets and low moldy fluids. Then you are going to look for porties. You have to look whether there are thrombus. You are going to look for thrombus in two places. First one is the coronaries, second one is the pulmonary arteries. If it is coronary thrombus, that means it is myocardial infarction. So you might use fibrinolytics or you might consider PCI. If it is pulmonary embolism you are suspecting, you have to use fibrinolytics. If it is tension pneumothorax, <coughs> you have to do the do the rapid, so the uh, someone who is doing the ARV should auscultate the patient and see whether the chest, that uh, bilateral AR entry in the lungs is equal or not. If you found tension pneumothorax, you have to do rapid decompression with thoracostomy or needle thoracocentesis. There are certain situations that patient might get tamponade. It is difficult to detect, but ultrasound scans might help you. And uh, focused cardiac ultrasound can detect this and resuscitative thoracotomy can be done. Resuscitative thoracotomy, you can find the videos specifically in YouTube and uh, uh, viewer discretion is advised so I did not put any videos here. And uh, toxins, uh, you have to look for the toxins, maybe the pair may be poisoning or drug overdose. As we are short of uh, time, I'm not planning to play this video but uh, I might play it and you can watch it while you are eating. <laughs> and uh, so if the patient is having witness VF or uh, pulseless VT cardiac arrest in your witness, then it is advised to give three successive stack shocks. That means you can give three shocks continuously and then start chest compressions and it is the same energy you are using. If these three stack shocks are unsuccessful, then uh, you can continue the CPR as a shockable rhythm if the VTO pulseless, the VFO pulseless VT persist. And uh, if you are going to start that algorithm as you are unsuccessful in three stack shocks, you must consider the three stack shocks as one shock in the V of algorithm. Then you can deliver another two shocks. And you should, IV amiodarone giving in any shockable rhythm is always a, uh, a similar thing because always IV amiodarone is given after three shocks. It doesn't matter whether the stacked shocks or whether they are three separate shocks. So once, if you are successful in your CPR, so you have to, you will get this as a return of spontaneous circulation. So detecting of ROSC, uh, you can, you have to find these things. There will be a cardiac rhythm compatible with the pulse and there will be palpable pulse. There will be recordable blood pressure and there is a rise in arterial blood pressure waveform and specifically, very specific sign is, there is a rise in end tidal CO2 up to three times in capnography. So I will be talking about this and uh, once the patient is, patient has achieved the ROSC, you have to adhere to the A, B, C, D, E approach and you have to reassess the patient according to this approach. And you must avoid unnecessary adrenaline after you have achieved ROSC because it can induce tachycardia and myocardial ischemia even in minute doses. So let's speak a bit about waveform. I'm sorry that I have exceeded my time but uh, I kindly need to get some more minutes. So waveform capnography in any CPR is extremely important. This is entitled EGCO2. So this specific yellow point is the entitled CO2. 
A to B means any of the inspiration. B to C means that you are starting to expirate and initial part is actually, actually the upper airway emptying. C to D that the patient is exhaling and in, uh, that uh, putting away whatever remaining in the lower airways and that's why the entitled CO2. Entitled CO2 means the partial pressure of carbon dioxide measured at the end of expiration. So this is where, this the yellow point is the end of expiration. So that is why it is called entitled CO2. So this actually, the, what is the importance of this entitled CO2? That uh, CO2 is produced by aerobic metabolism, perfuse, in perfused tissues by aerobic metabolism. If there is no perfusion, there cannot be CO2. Obviously, if there is no CO2, ETCO2 cannot rise. That means there are certain amount of tissue perfusion. If you are successful in your CPR, there is a certain amount of tissue perfusion and ETCO2 will rise. So this will, this is a very helpful one actually. And usually the ATCO2 is most reliable when the trachea is intubated, but you can still use with the other equipments as well. So, that uh, there are certain aims of monitoring ETCO2. You can first thing is, if there's ETCO2, that uh, waveform is there, it means that the patient's endotracheal tube is in place. Otherwise, there will be no ETCO2 at all. And the monitoring of the quality of CPR will can be assessed by ETCO2. <coughs> ETCO2 is directly associated with chest compression death. And uh, you can detect ROSC during CPR with ETCO2. ETCO2 will rise up to three times from its baseline if the patient has achieved ROSC. And prognostication of CPR also can be done with ETCO2. So in general, ETCO2 tend to decrease in patients whom resuscitation is unsuccessful and it tends to increase in those who can, who will go on to achieve ROSC. And the failure to achieve ETCO2 more than 1.3 kilopascals during CPR is usually considered with as a poor outcome. So better the, that if you are going to get ROSC, ETCO2 will go up. Uh, so I'm not going to, I'm going to briefly discuss this. Actually, ultrasound is a very good equipment that can be used and in most of the European countries, they are usually using it during the CPR. And uh, it is usually called the POCUS, point of care ultrasound. And uh, POCUS can be used in certain situations to detect cardiac tamponade, mainly the tamponade, and uh, sometimes aortic dissection and uh, some myocardial ischemia. If it is, if the probe can be used as a eco probe and uh, pulmonary embolism and pneumothorax and hypovolemia you also can also be detected. So the duration of CPR is a problem. So when are you going to finish? Now you started the thing. When are you going to finish? So the leader should discuss with the team about stopping CPR. It, there's no monopoly here. I mean that you have to discuss with the team. It's not a singular decision. It depends on your clinical judgment and the likelihood of achieving OSC and the patient is having brain death already. It is advised to continue CPR if patient remains in VF or pulseless VT with a reversible course. If there is asystole more than 20 minutes in the absence of reversible courses, and you are still continuing else, after 20 minutes, it's better to stop. So that's all uh, I'm having here. I'll play, the, I'll, play the video, I'll play the video once the uh, dinner is started. I'm sorry for this, uh, that I have taken more time and uh, questions now. <laughs>
thank you dr gani for very interesting and very informative lecture uh, especially this lecture is very useful for our uh, doctors who are working in peripheral hospitals and uh, now we are coming to the q and a session and i'm sure dr gani will answer for the question you can ask if you have any question now for the clarification that sense of any questions from the audience may i ask a question of the guy ni uh, i think you may need another <laughs> lecture for that answer for that question so basically thank you very much again for the very useful uh, lecture uh, you know the, as a consultant uh, you know we have uh, seen lot of problems when you continue uh, basic life support and advanced life support in the ward and etu so uh, example the, there is no team lead So, like that, hmm, what are the most common practical problems you observe in our hospitals, especially if people are working in uh, periphery? And uh, what are the briefly, uh, the, what are the solutions for those uh, problems? Just, uh, just a very common problems, and we are asking what are the another lecture. So that I have seen lot of. Uh, thank you very much for asking that question, Dr. Oita. I have seen lot of problems and. Uh, <laughs> answering to the second part is is difficult how to address them well uh, first thing is that uh, apart from gayan i don't think anyone is having enough equipments in the hospital gayan is the only lucky person who is having enough equipments in this hospital <laughs> that is the very first thing sometimes the deep that uh, actually most of the equipments are not working and uh, if you want to check all three pulse that uh, pulse wave form blood pressure and saturation you need at least two monitors so we are short of equipment that is first thing then uh, i think uh, actually i have observed that people are having lot of good attitudes that the thing is that there is uh, no organization of that particular skills i mean uh, uh, certain people are good in chest compressions and uh, sometimes the very thin uh, that uh, very thin head house officers girls giving chest compressions uh, it's difficult for them sometimes that is not the correct person so that uh, personal allocation is not ideal it's not wrong it's not ideal and uh, we have not found each and every person's possibilities and impossibilities and uh, the other thing is communication that uh, someone is doing something and uh, that's what i mean by the lack of organization that uh, sometimes uh, the person who is giving chest compressions that uh, continuously doing it really cannot remember that is 30 to 2 the people who are giving the breaths they are just giving the breaths you uh, didn't during the compressions so something like that it can always happen it is because of the i mean it's not only the lack of organization the people are in a certain panic i would say it's as the third thing people almost almost all line i mean it's not for the consultant i'm telling that uh, junior people sometimes they are in panic oh my goodness what to do now no there's no need to panic i mean you are always having help you can ask for help so just pushing on the chest is not the only thing and fourth one is actually timing is usually not done so we do not have a specific time when we go for the icu consult and we have no time to tell the down time is this much was achieved after this long this much of period so uh, that we should hand over that particular detail to the icu consult and then it's easy for him to decide on after that rosc that uh, if the patient is enter in the icu it's easy to decide on the post resuscitation care and uh, i think uh, the other thing is that uh, not the doctors some other uh, healthcare personals are not agreeing to the lead leader's decision when the junior well, the junior medical personnel is hand, acting as a team lead 
this should be educated and prevented because that uh, we have to tell it is not anyone is command mm? it is that uh, we, so we are going doing a team work the orders are mandate the orders should be given other it's a mandatory thing you do this you do this it's mandatory it is not uh, i mean we are not trying to control anyone that some of the other healthcare personnels think they know better than the doctor some of the doctors and they are trying to implement their own things so i don't think it is very successful for the patients success thank you very much dr gaini very you know uh, Sure. Very interesting answer. And also, if you have any questions, can you ask now? Yeah, Dr. Gaya. So, thank you very much for uh, arranging this kind of uh, presentation. So, I am wondering why you haven't been an anesthetist rather than a VP <laughs> regarding this presentation. So, one thing is. Uh, that uh, according to the newest guideline, no, uh, according to your knowledge, is there any place for bicarbonate during the resuscitation? Well, the last guideline, uh, actually I haven't specifically looked for that. Uh, I hope that you might enlighten us with that. Uh, I mean, I really don't know about that. Yes. Uh, I have, in my experience, uh, I have seen that all the Everyone is uh, trying to give bicarbonate. So the role of bicarbonate there is uh, to reduce the acidosis because patient is in hypolemic state and shock. So we can't uh, think about the circulation at that time. So however, that anaerobic metabolism will be occurred and patient will be in acidosis. In the guideline, they don't recommend it, but as practice I have seen even anesthetists giving bicarbonate. So to clarify that I am asking from you. So to well have I, I actually again I haven't read anything like that in the guideline. What is your opinion on this? As I think that they have asked to give fluids to manage the acidemia, yes. not yes. the bicarbonate. So that two two thousand twenty one guideline they don't recommend the bicarbonate even atrophy. So, but I have experience and I have seen the pay person is uh, resuscitated that the scheme that board people are usually giving bicarbonate and entropy during the resuscitation, but it is not recommended. So, that what, what is I your opinion on, I'm sorry for asking questions <laughs> for you, but is, uh, is atropy now, we actually, in uh, none of our resuscitations, we usually give atropy, we never give. So, is it proven to be harmful now? No, it is during the, the we give CPR for the cardiac arrest patients, no? so in cardiac arrest, uh, we don't uh, give atropine. So atropine business will do by the adrenaline. And uh, bicarbonate also not recommend, but uh, after achieving the ROSC and the patient is on uh, persistent uh, acidosis, so you can try with the bicarbonate, not during the resuscitation. That is the recommendation. Thank you, Dr. Gayan, uh, for your question and the, the explanation. And also, I also think, uh, according to the new guidelines, uh, the atropine and uh, bicarbonate is usually not generally recommended by the, the European guidelines for this, whatever the resuscitation here, right? Uh, then, uh, any, any questions other than that? Okay, thank you very much again, Dr. Gayani, for the excellent presentation. and. Also, I would like to take this opportunity to thank uh, 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 personally uh, uh, for the director of our hospital, who is not here today because he is not well, and uh, all consultants who are here today. And especially, I would like to thank uh, uh, the members of the academic subcommittee and uh, also doctors who are working in our hospital. Uh, they, they worked tirelessly during the last couple of days. Uh, to make this event success. Thank you very much for your uh, tireless work during the last few days. And also, I would like to thank uh, 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 all uh, participants.
participants today from our hospitals and also from other hospitals. Uh, thank you very much. And also, I would like to thank uh, sponsors today, Soclogic Pharmaceuticals, Dusal, Coop, Xenoxon, uh, Becomsi, and uh, Neurosamilate, uh, especially Mr. Didip and Mr. Gayan. Uh, and also the Cytex Pharmaceuticals New Coxia team, Mr. Niroshan, and also Astron Pharmaceuticals, uh, Medpik and Sitavik, uh, Mr. Tatura, and also Hilton Pharma, who are sponsors today for the today event. Also, finally, again, thank you very much, Dr. Gayani, for very interesting and very informative presentation, which is very useful for our doctors who are working in uh, my young hospital and also peripheral hospitals. Thank you. And also, uh, we have uh, another session of Q&A. And uh, can we see the link here? So we display this link here, and uh, then you can log into the link, and uh, within 10 minutes' time, you can uh, answer for the questions. There are 10 questions, and Dr. Gaini discuss uh, questions at the answers at the end of the uh, While you attempt on answering, uh, we take this opportunity to pay our sincere gratitude to our speaker. Thank you very much, Madam, for accepting our invitation, sharing your valuable time, and conducting an extremely fruitful session today after coming all the way from Anuradhapura. Please accept our sincere gratitude. On behalf of the Clinical Society, let me cordially invite our President, Dr. Rohit Amaril Tarana, to present the token of appreciation. Thank you. Madam, please remain on the stage. We have two more tokens. Next, uh, next appreciation is from the branch union of GMOA. This invitation goes to Dr. Janaka Jaisinghe, the president of the branch union, to present the token. Last, I would like to invite Dr. Sarasavi, Senior House Officer of the Medical Unit, to present the token representing the Medical Unit. Dear friends, we have few announcements. One is uh, you can collect your certificates from the registration desk before you leave the hall. And uh, we have our next session on Thursday, 4th April, 12.30 p.m. to 1.30 p.m. And uh, we are not going to overload you with medicine. Uh, next session will be on a surgical topic. We would also like to invite 
you to attend the continuing professional development lecture organized by the academic subcommittee of GMOA, Dr. Niranjan Visanayaka, consultant respiratory physician, will be talking to you on facing challenges of deaths due to tuberculosis in Sri Lanka tomorrow at 11.30 a.m. We will be screening the presentation at the old auditorium near the director's office. An e-certificate with a CPD point will be given to all the participants. All are welcome. Five, five minutes more and uh, only one answer we have received yet.
1 minute more Five, four, three, two, one. It's over. Until we analyze your answers, uh, I would like to invite Dr. Dayani Samarathunga to discuss the questions with you. So the first question, uh, early defibrillation within three to five minutes of collapse can produce survival rates as high as uh, actually 50 to 70 percent. This figure is given by European Resuscitation Council, uh, so it is a fact. 10 to 20, 85, that it is not high as 85 to 90, it is not low as 10 to 20. But each delay of one minute can reduce the survival rate up to 10 to 12 percent. Chain of survival does not include uh, staff education, it is comes on the chain of prevention. Chain of survival uh, is that is not included. So which one is incorrect related to news? Uh, malignant hypertension the answer is only new onset confusion is considered as significant. Uh, all the others are correct. Malignant hypertension, which means the blood pressure is above, systolic blood pressure above 180, it will cause high news because it is uh, itself considered as news scope 3. Apnea, again, uh, respiratory rate less than 8, contains 3. And uh, SpO2 scale 2 should be used for hypercarbic patients. Oh, sorry, that uh, <laughs> I think uh, yes, it's my problem. Uh, incorrect as statement is I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Two. I'm sorry. It's my uh, wrong. That uh, only new onset confusion is considered as significant is a correct answer. Can you please attend to that, Kausha? No. <laughs> I'm so sorry for that. The thumb person has scored 100%. Uh, can we do something about it? Okay, next, uh, let's go to the next one. Uh, which one is incorrect pertaining to the causes of cardiac arrest? Pulmonary embolism can lead to type 2 respiratory failure, usually causes 
type 1 respiratory failure and uh, trauma with fracture mandible can lead to airway obstruction it's a true statement myasthenia gravis is a neuromuscular junction disorder which can lead to muscle paralysis and muscle paralysis can cause poor respiratory effort asphyxia following airway obstruction is a cause for secondary circulatory problem so the incorrect statement is the fourth one which response is correct related to the ABCD assessment? Paradoxical chest and abdominal movements are assessed under ARV. Yes, so in ARV, uh, look, listen, feel, uh, you can check paradoxical chest movements if the patient is still having a uh, breathing effort. Complete absence of airway sounds indicate partial obstruction is an incorrect statement. It indicates complete obstruction. Pattern of breathing is not significant during effort of breathing assessment. Uh, pattern of breathing is important. Why I put this response is that in my COVID experience, most of the time, uh, junior doctors are telling uh, respirate rate is normal and there's no problem. There was actually there were a lot of problems because it was labored breathing or that was apnea and on and off apnea. So pattern of breathing is important. It is not solely the saturation, no. Respirate rate, you do not wait the saturation to drop. Or the respirate rate to go high. Patient cannot increase the respirate rate. Patient is already exhausted. So pattern of breathing is important. A narrow pulse pressure suggests sepsis or epilepsis. No, it is not suggest that it is a cardiogenic shock. Yes, so pattern of breathing is important. 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 Pattern of breath
you have, have to find, find something about it. it. You, you just can't stop everything and send the patient to ICU. I, I think, think I am really happy about it. About it. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, post resuscitation care should be continued according to ABCDE approach. That is a correct statement. Avoid unnecessary adrenaline in a patient with clots should be done. It's a correct statement. There is no palpable central pulses, the loss is not acute, even if there is a rhythm in cardiac monitoring, this is a correct statement, then it is considered as pulse of electrical activity, not the loss. Select the false statement regarding the waveform capnography during CPR. High ETCO2 values during CPR is associated with lower chance of loss, ease and higher mortality, ease of incorrect statement. If you get high ETCO2, it means you are getting some perfusion of your tissue, which means there's a high chance of success in CPR and lower mortality. And entitled CO2 is the partial pressure of CO2 measured at the end of expiration, correct? Waveform capnography enables a continuous non-invasive measurement of PCO2, correct? Presence of ETCO2 indicates ET tube is in the way. It's a correct statement. 4Hs and 4Ts does not include pulmonary tumor. Myocardial infarction, it's a thrombus is considered under the thrombus 4Ts. Pulmonary embolism con considered under 4Ts. Intraabdominal hemorrhage will cause hypovolemia. It is considered under 4Hs. Pulmonary tumor is not considered. Thank you. Again, I am. Uh, I really apologize for my uh, wrong. Actually, that I'm really sorry about it. Let me announce the winner of the mini quiz. I mean, after never the Okay. Uh, scoring 90 marks, we have five doctors, but with minimum time of five minutes and 29 seconds. And the winner is Dr. K M R D A Virasekara, SHO Pediatrics. I would like to invite Dr. Gaini Samaradunde to give the present as well. As we have come to the end of today's session, let us take this opportunity to thank all who supported. Especially, we must thank our speaker, Dr. Gaini Samaratunga, the director, Dr. Amis Bandara, Dr. Rohita Amaravitarana, Dr. Prabash Hathuru Singh and the medical unit, Dr. Janaka Jai Singh and the GMOA branch union. Let us also thank to our sponsors, Softlogic Pharmaceuticals, Fidex Pharmaceuticals, Astron Pharmaceuticals, and Hilton Pharma. My heartfelt gratitude goes to Dr. Kaushal, Dr. Bharat, Dr. Salinder, and all the committee members and all who participated today. Dear friends, I would appreciate if could take few seconds to provide us with the feedback. The link is on the group. This night is too young to say goodbye. Please join us for the dinner and a pleasant night with, filled with music. Hope you enjoy. Good night.